Gentiles, fellow heirs. God's covenant with Abraham gave assurance that all the blessings God purposed for mankind would come to them through his posterity. The Jews were the natural seed of Abraham, and properly to them belonged the promises. But when all Jews possessed of the faith of Abraham had been privileged to come in with Jesus and become his joint heirs in the Messianic kingdom, then God, through St. Peter, used the second key to the kingdom. He threw open the door of opportunity to the Gentiles that they might become fellow heirs with the Jews in the Messianic kingdom. Three and a half years after Pentecost, the angel of the Lord appeared to Cornelius. He told him that now God was ready to accept his prayers and his devotion. He told him to send for St. Peter at Joppa. From him he would hear words necessary to be believed in order that he might be fully accepted of God and receive the Holy Spirit. Three messengers were sent to fetch St. Peter. Meantime, God prepared the apostle. He was told that what God had cleansed, he should not consider any longer unclean. St. Peter associated his dream with his visitors and promptly went to Cornelius' home. He found Cornelius and his family devout and ready to hear. He proceeded to tell them the true story of Jesus, his death, his resurrection, the call of the church to be his bride class, proving their worthiness by loyalty and faithfulness, even unto death. While St. Peter was speaking, these consecrated people drinking in the message fully accepted the terms of discipleship. Then God gave a manifestation of his acceptance of them by the gift of the Spirit, such as was common to all Christians at the beginning of this age. St. Peter astonished then said, if these have received the Holy Spirit, who can forbid them water baptism, which is only a symbol of their consecration to be dead with Christ? Here Gentiles first began to be grafted into the olive tree of Romans 11.17. The church at Antioch. Gradually the gospel message found hearing ears amongst the Gentiles, but fewer in number. The law training of the Jews had been God's special blessing to them, preparing some of them for the gospel. The first church in which Gentiles seemed to predominate in numbers was at Antioch. Barnabas, Silas, and others were prominent amongst the brethren there, and later St. Paul. It was at Antioch that the followers of Jesus were first called Christians. Many Christians wished that no other name had ever been accepted. The Antioch Church, according to the Bible record, had very simple arrangements, similar to those practiced by Jesus and the Apostles. Forms and ceremonies had not yet entered to crowd out the simplicity of Christ with mere forms of godliness. They met for growth in grace, knowledge, love, and to assist each other in the narrow way. When fairly underway in their study, they partook of the missionary spirit, and authorized and financed a mission which was conducted by St. Paul and Barnabas. Other missions were also conducted, as recorded in the book of Acts. Not long after this, the terrible persecutions of Nero and Diocletian came upon the church. These Roman emperors found diversion and relief from ennui in the horrible tortures they inflicted upon the inoffensive followers of Jesus, whose mission in the world is merely to do good to all men as they have opportunity, especially to the household of faith, and to prepare themselves and each other for association with their Redeemer in the coming kingdom. Why did God permit persecution? The answer is that testings of faith and loyalty to God are as necessary to Jesus' followers as they were to himself, and for the same reason, to develop and crystallize character. These correspond to Jesus' own persecution and crucifixion. Thus he explained, saying, It was necessary that the Son of Man should suffer and enter into his glory. The elect walk in his steps. Berean Bible students, the little gathering of believers at Berea is famous amongst God's people by St. Paul's declaration. 
They of Berea were more noble than those of Thessalonica in that they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things which St. Paul preached were true. They were but a little class, yet their faithfulness to God's word caused them to be known as Berean Bible students. The early church met not in costly temples, nor did their elders and deacons have rich robes of office, nor did the services consist of showy display. They simply gathered as children of God, begotten of the one Holy Spirit, and inspired by the one faith once delivered to the saints. They gathered as the brethren of Jesus, that they might be under his direction and care, as the only head of the church, as he declared, One is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. They met to study the message of Jesus and the apostles. Bible students in our day have much advantage over these. We have convenient cheap Bibles, ability to read them, and good lights, such as our forefathers never thought possible. Bible students today are encouraged also when they consider that the Bible distinctly teaches that when men shall be running to and fro and worldwide knowledge shall be increased, then the wise virgins, the Lord's people, will understand certain features of the divine plan previously kept hidden by divine intention. They perceive that we are in this day of running to and fro by every means of conveyance, and that free schools, compulsory education, etc., are bringing the foretold increase of knowledge. These things mark the time for the wise of God's people to understand the Bible. How needful for this special light when so many are falling away from all faith in the Bible under the teachings of so-called higher criticism, which denies that the Bible is the divinely inspired message of God. We should not only awake, but put on the whole armor of God. Apostolic succession. All Christians claim that there were erroneous doctrines taught in the past, which cannot be supported in the clearer light of our day. All rejoice in the spirit of greater amity spreading amongst Christians of various denominations, Catholic and Protestant. How did Christianity get into such a befogged condition that followers of Jesus thought they were honoring God in torturing their fellow men? With great unanimity, Bible students seem to be reaching the conclusion that the difficulty started in the doctrine of apostolic succession. The doctrine that bishops of the church were apostles, inspired in the same sense as the twelve. Pope Pius X realizes that the people no longer regard the bishops as inspired authority and successors to the apostles in office. Evidently himself dissenting, he has recently commanded that Roman Catholics be instructed to study the Bible thus to come under the influence of the teachings of the inspired twelve apostles. All are gradually seeing that the twelve apostles of the Lamb, St. Paul taking the place of Judas, are the only divinely inspired authorities of the church. The church, after the death of the apostles, not having the conveniences of Bibles and education, look too implicitly to their bishops or pastors and without authority accredited them with divine inspiration, similar to the Twelve. After 200 years, the mistake was partially recognized, and an attempt was made to rectify it, but in the wrong direction. It was found that the different bishops taught widely different contradictory doctrines. It was realized that these contradictions were not inspired by the Holy Spirit. Emperor Constantine, not baptized, called the Nicene Council of all the Apostolic Bishops at Nicaea, A.D. 325. About one-third, 384, came. These were commanded to decide on a creed. They wrangled for months. Then the Emperor decided, and the Nicene Creed was the result. The Emperor's edict was that all not consenting to it 
should be exiled. <laughs> 